Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And first of all, last week I talked about, we're on a, you've heard of the man hunt? We're on a woman hunt to find sharp women who want to start an Operation Healthy Girlfriend chapter. And a lot of you wrote to me, that's great. And I put you in touch with Dr. Lana Contos to talk about this. This is such a fun, interesting way to help other women gain better health and meet new and interesting friends. and. I build bonds with women to travel through life with. I belong to groups like this in the past, and they've been a really important part of my life. So I just encourage you to look into it. Uh, a couple of announcements this week. Uh, every month we do a free workshop that allows people to get a taste of our content. We try to pick something interesting. So on November 15th at 9 p.m., I'm going to do a workshop on how to have a conversation with other people about health. So if you're one of those people who um, sometimes says, gosh, nobody will listen to me, my family won't listen to me, my friends won't listen to me, every time I bring it up, people roll their eyes, there, there are some things we can do a little bit differently to get our friends and family to maybe be a little bit more willing to listen. So um, I think it's worth, if you really care about other people and you'd like to deliver the message in a way that you think that they'll listen, this is a great call. So it's 9 p.m. Eastern time. All you have to do is send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. We'll get you signed up, send you call-in information and that sort of thing. And if you've never participated in one of these, I invite you to try it. It's really fun to, for me to meet new people on the phone and take questions from people who I've never spoken to before. And then, of course, we're getting close to the day. It's conference time in just three weeks, November 4th through 6th, and we have the best speakers here. And one new thing, um, there's a video, well, there's two things. One, there's a video of me talking about the conference on our website at wellnessforumhealth.com. The other thing is Howard Jacobson, good friend and colleague of mine in North Carolina, recorded a great podcast that we've also posted on our website, so you can go there and listen to that, too. And in the podcast, I talk a lot, uh, Howard asked me a lot of questions, and I talk a lot about the philosophical uh, similarities and differences between Dr. Campbell, who is the author of China Study, and Tom Seyfried, who is the author of Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, um, particularly since Dr. Seyfried is suggesting in the book that perhaps a ketogenic diet might be an appropriate way to treat some people with intractable and curable cancers. So how do you reconcile all of that? And I've had a lot of inquiries about that. First of all, you have to be here because this is the type of thing that is fun to watch and listen to and learn from. And it, it, watching great Great scientists exchange information can be the highlight of your year. And you might be thinking, well, maybe for you, Dr. Pan, because you're a science nerd, but really for everybody, I promise you, you will enjoy it if you come. But if not, at least go listen to the podcast and learn more about it. Um, and then you can just sit at home and think about the cake we're having for our anniversary celebration and all the fabulous meals we're sharing and all the new people we're meeting. See, you really do want to come be there on November 4th through 6th. Okay. Two topics today. Um, the first one, we're going to talk about telomeres, talking about being a science nerd. Only I would like to talk about telomeres for a long time. All right, so what are telomeres? They're caps at the end of each DNA string, just like um, you have those plastic caps at the end of shoelaces that keep the shoelaces from fraying. As we age, our telomeres get shorter, and when they too, get too short, the cells can't replicate and they actually die degeneration and death of the cell follows. And um, the telomeres of all of our cells will shorten over time, but the cells that are the most vulnerable are the ones that reproduce more often, like those that are found in the skin, the hair, the immune system. They are the most vulnerable to telomere shortening. Well, much of the telomere shortening that goes on is just a subject of time passing, and we really can't do anything about that. Diet and lifestyle habits and lifetime experiences can either accelerate the shortening or slow it down quite a bit, and, um, and that, therefore slow down the aging process. Uh, exercise affects telomere length, as does body weight, smoking, and diet. People who are sedentary can expect their telomeres to shorten more quickly than people who are physically active. And the more active you are, the better. Athletes have significantly slower telomere shortening as compared to non-athletes. Both obesity and smoking will result in more rapid, rapid shortening of telomeres due to the fact that they are both um, representatives of, of states of inflammation and oxidative stress. And of course, that brings us to diet, which has a profound effect on telomere length. 
Telomeres are longer in people who eat a diet that is higher in fiber and carbohydrate. And I'll just insert here, I assume you know what I'm talking about carbohydrate, not toaster pastries. We're talking about sweet potatoes and broccoli. And lower in polyunsaturated fat and protein. Research shows that if you reduce protein by 40%, you can have a 15% longer lifespan due to reduced telomere shortening. Most people in our country eat too much protein. And of course, the question we all get asked if we talk about plant-based diets, oh my gosh, where do you get your protein? Protein deficiency is not a problem. Protein excess is. Now, diets higher in antioxidants, such as vitamin E, C, beta carotene, protective of telomeres. Diets lacking in these antioxidants result in shorter telomeres. Um, and the reason is that antioxidants pr protect the DNA of telomeres from oxidative damage. Now, really interesting, I talked about um, life circumstances. Stress can affect the tel telomere length as well. And the effect begins in childhood. In fact, the greatest impact on stress of stress on telomere length is during childhood, with each adverse event causing an 11% increased risk of shorter telomeres after the age of 50. In one study, researchers analyzed the telomere lengths of cells taken from the saliva of over 4,500 people age 50 or older who were part of a university's, uh, University of Michigan's health study. The questionnaires were used to gather information on childhood adversities, which included things like trouble with the police before the kids were 18, repeating a school grade, parental use of drugs and alcohol and physical abuse, and then adult adversities, which included death of a close family member, physical attack, filing, firing a weapon in combat, and getting laid off from a job. The subjects were not picked because they had recognizable uh, signs of some type of stress-related disorder, but they were just members of the general public. Now, there was a cumulative effect of stress over an individual's lifetime, which increased the risk of having shorter telomeres after the age of 60, but the biggest increase um, in the risk of telomere shortening was the events that took place in childhood, and those eclipsed all of the other things I've been talking about, such as body mass index, smoking status, diet, and other health issues. Uh, for adults, financial stress had the biggest effect after age 50. More rapid telomere shortening is associated with a lot of different conditions, including coronary artery disease, heart attack, diabetes, and cancer. And of course, many of these diseases lead to premature death. So these are all good reasons for protecting your telomeres by practicing healthy habits. It's impossible to control exposure to stress in childhood. Obviously, we can't go back and fix things that happened to us when we were little people, but everybody can choose to make better choices in life from this point forward concerning diet, smoking status, exercise, and BMI. And to a certain extent, our stress levels too. Telomere shortening is just one additional mechanism of action that explains how our diet and habits and other lifestyle habits um, impact our health. And then the next topic I want to cover um, is, the, is the hygiene hypothesis, which is, um, it, what it is, is it states that the natural development of the immune system is suppressed by a lot of modern practices, which include exposure to infectious, lack, lack of exposure to infectious agents and parasites, vaccines, uh, cleanliness uh, during childhood. All of these things have created such a sanitary environment that kids do not grow up um, exercising their immune system, if you will. And so a lot of people and scientists and researchers have hypothesized that this could be a contributing factor to the increased risk of allergy, asthma, autoimmune disease, and other conditions which are representative of an immune system that's misbehaving. And it is true that an inverse um, relationship between things like exposure to farm animals and allergy has been observed. So uh, this idea is not without some uh, reason and belief. So in a research project recently, researchers compared the Amish community in Indiana with a community of Hutterites living in South Dakota. The communities are really similar because they both engage in farming and they're rather cloistered communities. But the big difference is that the Amish operate traditional family type farms, whereas the Hutterites operate much bigger and industrial farms. Um, the rates of allergy and asthma are really different between the groups too. The incidence of allergy, for example, is 21% in the Amish and 33% in the Hutterite children. It's, you know, 50% more. 
So researchers looked at uh, all the immunological factors for allergy in both groups of kids. And, and the, um, if you look at all of the markers for allergy in an overactive immune system, the Amish children had significantly lower ones. Um, and they lived in homes with levels of dust that were seven times higher than the Hutterite children. And there were big differences in the bacterial content of the dust in these households as well. So the researchers hypothesized that maybe, again, not living in such a clean environment, exposure to some house dust, maybe that was the modifying agent. So they compared the effects of the Amish and Hutterite dust in a mouse model of allergic asthma. And the Hutterite dust was not protective while the Amish dust was. And there was significantly, um, diff there were significant differences in all kinds of markers, I won't read them off to you, that are indicative of allergies. So uh, the study concluded that there were differences in the microbial content of Amish and Hutterite dust, which switched on the innate immune pathways in the Amish children, leading to better immune function. Now what does this mean? Why am I bringing this up? Nobody's proposing that we stop cleaning our houses or return to an era where people were dying of waterborne diseases because we had unsanitary water with feces flowing in the streets. I mean, that's not what we're saying here. What I am saying, and a growing number of people are saying this, is perhaps we've gone a little bit over the top on some things. I mean, the number of vaccinations to prevent children from developing any illnesses continues to go up. And there is some evidence that vaccinations keep kids from getting, it does keep kids in some instances from getting childhood diseases, but it also may increase their risk of having other things happen like allergy, asthma, autoimmune. Another thing, you know, we're washing your skin with antibacterial soap, um, treating every minor childhood illness with drugs. Um, I, I think um, this is probably a sign of my age, but when I was growing up, there was much less tendency to haul kids off to the doctor every time they had a sniffle, keep them home from school, and give them some drug treatment. I mean, if I was really kind of under the weather, a day at home resting, and then the next day back back to school, I think uh, I think our parents probably took us to the doctor when we were really sick, but there wasn't that much of that going on. On, and maybe that was because our immune systems developed a lot more normally. So anyway, I think there's something to it and I think we got to find some type of middle ground between going back to where we were 107 years ago, which was really awful, and where we are today, which is really over the top in terms of uh, living in pristine environments. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass that on to any, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.